Welcome to October everybody, almost at the end of the year, and welcome to the Night Sky October. If you're new here, the Night Sky series is my series of a curated list of deep sky objects, so nebula, galaxies, star clusters, anything like that, planets, events, meteor showers, the moon, anything that's going on in our night skies throughout October, original name, I know. How this is going to work is I'm going to have a list of common and popular focal lengths to choose from, so if you have a telescope of that length, great. These are all compared against a full frame camera at 35 millimeters. Don't worry though, because if you have a camera of a different sensor size, I also have comparative focal lengths on the side here. So you are going to find something for every setup. I almost guarantee you. Almost because my lawyer told me to not make commitments. With that said, then we're gonna get into this. As always, there's gonna be timestamps down in the description down below. And we are going to begin with another constellation shot. So 35 to 50 millimeters on again, a full frame camera. This is going to be the constellation of Cepheus. Get it in nice and early, won't be a TNS video without a Cepheus mention. I should probably start a hashtag Cepheus. However, at 35 to 50 millimeters, you can capture the entire constellation of Cepheus. There's a lot going on in this constellation. Chief amongst which will probably start popping out is the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. Now with that said, let's move on to some actual telescope targets. Kicking us off then at 200, 300 millimeters, is a pair of nebulae located in the constellation of Cygnus. Now Cygnus is on its way out. This is your last chance to really to catch Cygnus this year. Within it, we've got NGC 6960 and 6992, which is the Western and Eastern Veil complex, nebula complex. So it's that really interesting looking wispy nebula located in Cygnus. They are really high and rich in hydrogen alpha and oxygen. So dual narrowband pass filters, gonna have a field day here. So 200 and 300 millimeters, that's my suggestion. Next up at 300 to 400 millimeters, if you don't have a wide angle lens or a tracker to take a picture of the entire Cepheus constellation, it's time to punch into it to IC1369. This is the Elephant's Trunk Nebula, as mentioned earlier. It's almost like I foreshadowed it. So the Elephant's Trunk Nebula, hydrogen alpha region, well, neb emission-based nebula, really, really famous. It's got the iconic Elephant's Trunk in it. This, at this focal length, we're gonna take a picture of the whole thing. Of course, you could always punch into that or crop it down. Now, my suggestion to 500, 600 millimeters, the benefit is going to be very dependent on how dark your skies are, which is going to be NGC 7023, the Iris Nebula. Now, in normal light polluted skies, like most of us are probably shooting from, you will see the Iris, you will get something because it's got a reflection element in it. However, the darker your skies go and the more integration time you get, the more you'll notice is there is a lot of beautiful dark dust around the Iris Nebula, which really contrasts against the jewel inside of it itself. This is one I definitely recommend going for if you have really like bought a one or two skies around a new moon area, quite specific, but something to go for. Darker skies, better result with this one. Good luck. 700 to 800 millimeters, we're gonna swing over to the constellation of Perseus. And no, it's not the California Nebula, but it is NGC 1491, known as the Fossil Footprint Nebula. Often overlooked, I this keeps falling off of my radar. Uh, every time I see it, though, I love it. It's a emission and reflective nebula itself. It seems to have some reflective elements in there, some ref, uh, emission-based elements in there. So we're gonna have to do a bit of a combination to get a good picture of this, probably a HARGB composite. So if you've got 700 to 800 with a clear shot at Perseus, go give this little overlooked nebula some love. 1000 millimeters getting into the longer focal lengths I'm going to talk about today. We can go back to the constellation Cepheus and we're going to be looking at NGC 7380, which is the Wizard Nebula. Now the Wizard Nebula doesn't really need any introduction. It's a very famous, very popular target. Emission-based nebula, again, they're very common, very versatile art targets to take a picture of. I do recommend trying this one in SHO if you have the option to. I find this one really differentiates the different layers of the image and you can start seeing the wizard. Now, if you think I've been talking about Cepheus far too much and you want something else to choose from, swing over to the constellation of Gemini, still again at 1000 millimeters for IC443, the Jellyfish Nebula. Really, really easy to see how this one got its name. And you can do the classic framing where the jellyfish is floating up to the bright star near it. Two to choose from for 1,000 millimeters. Don't say I don't treat. 
Now at the penultimate focal length I'm going to talk about, 1,500 millimeters, we're going to swing back over to the constellation Perseus. Great constellation, it's got something for everybody. And within here, we are going to find NGC 1579, otherwise known as the Northern Triffid Nebula. Unlike the more popular Triffid Nebula, which is really big and bright and shiny and got all these reflective elements in it, the Northern Triffid Nebula is a lot smaller, a bit more modest, a bit more humble, a bit more challenging to take a photograph of. But I think it is again overshadowed by the Triffid Nebula, which certainly is one of my favorite nebulas. So 1,500 millimeters, if you can see Perseus, let's give this one a go. So finally, rounding up the list at 2,000 millimeters, we have NGC 1555 otherwise known as Heinz Variable Nebula, located in the constellation of Taurus. I don't really see many images of this one, maybe because it's variable, it's, you know, it can fluctuate its size and everything like that, or its shape. So if you have a 2000 millimeter equivalent or telescope and you want something to photograph and you can see Taurus, then give this one a go. I'd love to see your photos of this. Be sure to tag me in them. Right, that's enough of deep sky objects. Now it's time to give the planet hunters some love. Now, when I choose planets for the night sky series, I only pick ones that really get above 20 degrees of altitude for a decent amount of time, you know, just long enough to really get some video footage of it. 20 degrees, because below that, we have the really thick, murky parts of the atmosphere. It's quite messy to take videos through it. So anything above 20 degrees. The first one to talk about is Mars. It has been up for the last couple of months. Mars is still a viable option throughout the night sky in October if you're looking for a planet to take a photograph of. If Mars isn't your cup of tea, we can always swing over to the king of the planets himself, Jupiter. And <laughs> Jupiter, again, needs no real introduction. If you've got a long focal length, you can fill the frame with Jupiter. We can get some good surface detail. If not, some people like to take photos where you get Jupiter and you can see its moons around it. Moving more superior to Jupiter then, we have Saturn, which is just about on the cusp of it. If you get up at the good time and locate it properly, you can still get a picture of Saturn. Saturn onto Uranus, so Uranus is a choice we can have this month as well. Again, it's gonna be quite small, it's gonna be quite difficult to take a photo of. You're gonna need the decent, the right equipment and the right seeing conditions. And if that is still not much of a challenge, we can also try and take a photo of Neptune because Neptune's up above 20 degrees as well. So that is the planet true list for the night sky in October. Moving on now then to the lunar phases for this month. So in case you wanna know when the new moon is to really kick those deep sky objects or when to get the filters out or when to start hunting planets, here is the list of the lunar phases. Beginning with the new moon, which falls on October the 2nd. The first quarter then falls onto the October 10th. The full moon, which is the hunter's moon, falls on October 17th, and the last quarter is October 24th. October's full moon gets its name from the fact that last month in September we had the harvest, and now we have the hunt. Creatures such as deer and foxes, they've been out eating a lot, they're getting a bit fatter, they're putting on weight for winter, which means they're actually a bit slower. And because the fields were bare after the harvest in September, they were easier to see and they were a bit slower. Also again, similarly, because of the full moon, it meant everything's a bit brighter for longer. So hunters could go out with longer hunting hours to find food for their families and their tribes. Now onto some events happening throughout the night skies in October. They're happening a bit later on in the month. There's only two I've really found worth talking about that I wish to share with you. The first of which being on the 19th of October, happening around 9 p.m. from the United Kingdom is the moon is going to pass very close to the target Pleiades, the deep sky object Pleiades M45, in the constellation of Taurus. Which means if you get a decent lens out and the right focal lengths, you can start trying to get a photo of the two of them together. Now you're never going to expose for the moon and get the nebulosity from the Pleiades. At the same time, you'll have to composite the image. And on the 21st of October, Jupiter is actually very close to the moon. So much so that you have a 200 millimeter lens, you can get a picture of the two of them. So that happens on the 21st of October. And finally, to round out the list of the night sky in October, we have a meteor shower to talk about. Running from the 1st of October through to the 7th of November, we have the Orinids meteor shower, which emanate from, wait for it, near the constellation of Orion. Could you believe it? I don't know how they find the names of these things. So this meteor shower is going to peak around the 21st of October as well. 
there's going to be a peak rate of about 20 meters an hour. However, being the 21st of October, we are going to have a waning gibbous moon to contend with. It may wash the sky out a bit, depends on what times you're taking your photographs for. Again, meteors though are quite bright usually, and we are taking long exposures of the night sky with a wide angle lens generally. Just got to be a bit wary that the moonlight may cast gradients over your photos or could just wash them out a bit. And that is it. That is the night sky in October all wrapped up and finished. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found something to choose from when you next have a clear sky and you want something to take a photograph of. Let me know in the comments down below what your favorite suggestion was. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. If you think I could have done better, go ahead, give it the thumbs down and consider subscribing for more content such as this. With all that said, now let's just say thank you very much for watching. Hope you have a clear skies. Hope you enjoyed the video. Keep looking up. Keep the cameras clicking. I'll see you later.